Okay. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak. I've also been told to stand close to my laptop for the Zoom people, but I tend to go walk about doing talks. So yeah, someone on Zoom, message in the chat if you can't hear me. Um, but yes, uh, for those of you who haven't met, my name is Ellie. I'm a PhD student here in London. I'm studying my PhD at City, but I'm also a visiting member of uh, LIMS. And yes, as Yang said, I'm going to be talking to you today about a very exciting project using genetic algorithms to generate cloud VR manifolds. Okay, so uh, yes, first of all, of course, I must shout out to my wonderful collaborators, Ed, who you heard from yesterday, and Yang, and then also Per, Vishnu, and Andre. So I will explain the construction in more detail in a second, but in short, you can get a Clavier manifold as a hypersurface in a toric variety from these so-called reflexive polytopes. And so uh, we care about Clavier manifolds, as Ed briefly mentioned yesterday in string theory, because they act as compactification spaces, and I'll explain more about that in a second. Uh, so yeah, we thought, is it possible to generate reflexive polytopes with machine learning algorithms? and therefore generate uh, Clavier manifolds. In particular, we were interested to see whether we could generate five-dimensional reflexive polytopes, because there already exists a complete classification of all of these polytopes in the lower dimensions. In five dimensions, we only have a partial classification. So here we have the opportunity to generate something new. And yes, the method we chose to generate these algorithms, these polytopes, sorry, is genetic algorithms. Uh, I should actually say we did try some other methods first. We initially started off by using some GANs with GNNs, but unfortunately we didn't see any sort of success with this one. Uh, we then moved on to trying reinforcement learning and we were sort of making some sort of progress in this. Uh, but then I got chatting to Andre at a conference. Uh, Andre originally wasn't working with us on this. And he suggested trying genetic algorithms because he'd seen that these had great success in other projects he was working on. So we brought Andre on board, tried out these genetic algorithms, and to our great surprise, even though they're super simple, they worked really, really well at this problem. So we ran the genetic algorithms, but I think actually it would be interesting in the future to go back and try reinforcement learning again. Uh, so that's something for the future. So quick outline of what I'm gonna be speaking to you today about. So I know this isn't a physics audience, it's mostly a maths audience. So I will start off with some preliminaries on physics, in particular to motivate why we care about Clavier manifolds. And then I will give you some preliminaries in the maths, in particular, what are reflexive polytopes? I know that there are some experts here in the audience, so that for you that will be more of a review. And then I will describe what genetic algorithms are and give you some details in the particular uh, genetic algorithm we use for our problem. And then I will show you the results, both of the uh, generation in the lower dimensions where that already exists, a complete classification, and also the results in five dimensions. And then I will summarize everything and talk about what we're doing next. So uh, in 2023, we sort of have this difficult situation in physics. So we have these two cornerstones. Uh, we have the standard model of particle physics and we have general relativity. So the standard model is a quantum theory that describes the three non-gravitational forces. So that's the weak force, the strong force and the electromagnetic force and uh, also the, ooh, the elementary particles. So it's a quantum field theory, which means that every particle is described by a field and the forces between the particles are described by the interactions of fields with uh, gauge fields. General relativity, on the other hand, is a classical theory uh, by the work of Einstein that describes uh, gravity as an emergent property of space and time. So uh, in contrast to the standard model, which is concerned of regions of small scale and low mass, general relativity, on the other hand, is concerned of regions of large scale and large mass. So usually you don't need to consider both theories together. Usually you're working in just one domain, so you're, you're fine just working with one. There are situations, however, where you would need both. So for instance, the center of a black hole or at the beginning of the Big Bang, where in both of those cases you have uh, small scales and so small distances, but you also have very, very large mass. And then when you try and put these two theories together, 
the mass breaks down and you get all sorts of ugly things happening and infinities popping up. So ideally, we want a mass of theories. So that's a theory of everything that encompasses both generativity and quantum mechanics. Uh, and that's what we call a theory of everything. So this theory of everything would combine not only the three non-gravitational forces in the standard model, but also gravity as well. So this diagram is of the relative strengths of the four forces and how we imagine the situation to be. So at low energies with just a few electron volts, you have all of the forces looking very different from each other. Then as you increase the energy at around the order of 100 giga electron volts, you have the weak and the electromagnetic force become unified and this is actually uh, proven experimentally because 100 giga electron volts is energy we're capable of reaching in experiments but at higher energy the energy at which we predict strong force to unify with the electron weak force it's unfortunately energy far greater than we could achieve in experiments but we do predict that the strong force does unify with the electron weak force and this unification is what we call the grand unification or a grand unified theory. And then if you go to even higher energies, we then have the unification of gravity, and this is our theory of everything. So uh, it's thought that immediately after the Big Bang, where things were super, super high energy, very high temperature, all of the four forces were unified. Very shortly after, things expanded, things cooled down. Then we had gravity splitting. Again, shortly after that, cooled down further. And we had strong force splitting, and finally, the electromagnetic and the weak force split. Ah, yes, I was playing around with Dali uh, during creating this presentation, and I asked Dali to produce an image of the solution to the combination of standard model with general relativity. And this is what I got. So, either it's really intelligent and it's trying to give me a message, and I'm just too stupid to understand it, or I think more likely is that AI hasn't yet come up with a theory of everything. <laughs> or at least that's what I like to do. So even though we don't have a proven theory of everything, we do have candidate theories. And the most promising theory is what we call string theory. So the main premise of string theory is that rather than everything being made up of uh, lots of zero dimensional point particles, instead, the fundamental building block is just one one dimensional string. And then you get the different particle properties we see in the standard model by different vibrational modes of this string. Uh, and actually, uh, string theory didn't start out as a theory of everything. It started out actually to trying to describe the strong force. It was abandoned in that regard for a better theory, quantum chromodynamics, but some keen people still continue to study it. And it was later discovered that actually it does give a candidate for quantum geometry. And uh, the original versions of string theory, which we now refer to as bosonic string theory, is uh, we're only describing bosons. So these are the force carrying particles, but we also have fermions in our universe. These are the matter particles. So we wanted to have a theory that includes both. And that's why supersymmetry was introduced. And supersymmetry is a space-time symmetry, which uh, relates these two things. So every boson will have a super partner fermion and vice versa. And they give them these awesome names like selectrons and squarks and guinos, which I find great. So yeah, string theory is wonderful as it's a candidate theory for quantum geometry, so quantum gravity, but it does come with some side effects. And the main side effect is that the theory only works mathematically if we have one dimension of time and nine dimensions of space. But we live in a world of one dimension of time and three dimensions of space. So what do we do with all of these extra spatial dimensions? One sort of sneaky uh, suggestion that string theorists came up with was hiding these extra dimensions uh, on a small compact manifold and essentially saying they're there, but you just can't see them. That's why we have them to observe them. So compactification means that the 10 dimensional manifold of space time is split up into a four dimensional Minkowski space and a compact six dimensional manifold. And because we want to satisfy general relativity, our six dimensional compact manifold must satisfy the vacuum Einstein equation. This puts a condition on 
our metric on the compact manifold that it's Ricci flats, which means that the Ricci tensor vanishes. And we have a supersymmetry condition, which uh, means that we must have holonomy group SU3 on our compact manifold. But a holonomy group SU3 manifold that's Ricci flats, this is just a Kahler man uh, sorry, a Clavier manifold. So this is why we string theorists are so obsessed with these manifolds. And you'll hear us talking about them a lot. Uh, Pretty much every string theory talk you go to, they'll say Clavier at least three times, I think, during your presentation. Um, and yeah, the other problem in string theory is you don't just have a single theory. There's actually five different versions of string theory. The good thing is, is that they're all related to each other, but various dualities. And also with this higher dimensional theory in 11 dimensions called M theory. And as I said in, String theory, we need to hide these extra six dimensions on a Clavier manifold. Uh, this Clavier is a complex, so we call it Clavier threefold with complex three dimensions. Similarly, in N theory, we compactify on a seven dimensional manifold to get down to our four dimensional Minkowski space. And this manifold is a G2 manifold. And you heard a lovely talk by Ed yesterday on G2. So this is some motivation why we are also interested in this. And if that wasn't complicated enough, we have another theory in another higher dimension, which we call F theory, and that's in 12 dimensions. Uh, but it's okay. It's dual again to one of our string theories. You can patch by on the yes. for us. We have it uh, dual to type 2 the string theory. Actually, yeah, this diagram gets even more messy. This is only just some of the dualities. It's far too complicated to put all of them in. I tried, didn't succeed. So <laughs> this is a dumbed down version. Uh, yes, in F theory, again, we want to go down to four dimensions. So now we have to hide eight dimensions. And the uh, compact manifold we use is now a Clavier fourfold. So, how do we construct Clavier manifolds? There are many different ways you can do this. The method that I'm going to speak about today is also the method that Ed spoke about yesterday, and also Tom mentioned in his talk as well. And that's constructing Clavier's hypersurfaces in toric varieties. So, uh, yeah, Tom did mention briefly that you can get a toric variety from a fan. And a fan is just a collection of cones. So you get a you build an affine toric variety from every cone in the fan, and then you glue these together in some uh, complicated way. But actually, you can get a fan from a polytope. So every place in the polytope, every edge in the two dimensional polytope gives you a cone in the fan, and then from the fan, you can get your toric variety. Uh, what Batia showed in the early 90s, 1993, is that if the polytope that you start with is one of these so-called reflexive polytopes, then if you take any generic anti-canonical hypersurface in your toric variety, this is a Clavier variety, which again, Tom mentioned, the ones with zero churn, is, and then, these in general are singular, you can take uh, certain triangulations of the polytope and you can resolve these singularities. So what are reflexive polytopes? Well, a polytope is just the convex hull of a set of points in a lattice. And then we say a polytope is a lattice polytope if it's all of its integer, sorry, all of its vertices, lie in lattice points. And we say a polytope satisfies the IP property if it just contains a single interior point of the origin. So to be specific about what I mean, so here it just has one point in the middle. Here we have one point in the middle. We have symmetric points in the faces, but these are the boundaries of which just one interior point of the B and the interior point of the B. And yeah, we can find a dual polytope, as you can see here, as the convex part of a set of points in the dual lattice such that the inner product between all the points in the original polytope is greater than or equal to minus one. <laughs> and then a polytope is said to be reflexive, simply if it's a lattice polytope that satisfies the IP property, and its dual is also a lattice polytope satisfying the IP property. So here in both cases, vertically drawn into lattice points, both cases, one into the origin, these two are actually two each other. For example, scaling both of which by two, but they don't have the same square. Exactly. Yeah. If you scale this up, you then have more to your points. Yeah. So, um, motivated by Batterell's discovery in 1993 that you can get these Clavier manifolds from toric varieties, 
sorry, from Reflexive Polytopes uh, in 1998, I believe, sometime in the late 90s, uh, Corrigan Scarpa developed this algorithm that can completely classify all reflexive polytopes in any given dimension. So the algorithm consists of two steps. Mm -hmm. Firstly, you construct all of the maximal polytopes such that any reflexive polytope is a subpolytope of one of the maximal. And then the second step is you just simply compute all of the subpolytopes of all the maximal polytopes and check which ones are reflexive or not. So at this point, it was already known that there were 16 reflexive polytopes in two dimensions, but they used their algorithm to generate all of the reflexive polytopes in three dimensions, and they found 4,319. And they then discovered all of the reflexive polytopes in four dimensions, and here they found already half a billion. So this is a huge data set. And of course, four-dimensional reflexive polytopes give us Clavier threefolds. And as I said, these are the compactification phases in string theory. So this data set is very extensively used in string theory. Uh, now, looking at the sequence, we have 16, 4,319, already half a billion. So you imagine if we go up one dimension higher to five dimensions, you're likely to have a huge number of reflexive polytopes. And actually, there was a prediction made uh, by Scarf and Scholler that they predict the number to be around 10 to the 18. So this is, yeah, very, very large. So rather than generating the entire data set, they instead generated, this is Scarf and Scholler now, uh, a partial data set. So the way they did that was basically just to do step one of the algorithm, construct all the maximal polytopes, and then they just checked which of these are automatically reflexive. And doing that, they created this data set of 185 billion. So later on, when I show you the data sets that we constructed with genetic algorithms of 5D reflexive polytopes, we check against this data set and see which ones were already known and which ones are new. The last thing I want to say about polytopes is the equivalences that exist between them. Uh, so this is sort of similar to what Tom was talking about in a different context yesterday. Uh, but imagine you have a polytope defined by its vertex matrix, which is where each of the columns are the vector coordinates of the vertices. You can imagine that simply reordering the columns corresponds to relabeling your vertices. But then when you take the convex hull, you're still getting the same identical polytope. So that we have this redundancy in the vertex matrix representation from this permutation. And there's another source of redundancy. Uh, so you can imagine you can do a coordinate transformation on the lattice. And this corresponds in the vertex matrix of just applying a GLNZ matrix, where N is the dimension of your polytope. So we have these two sources of redundancy. But when we generated data sets for reflexive polytopes, we wanted to know how many unique reflexive polytopes we had. So we wanted to remove all of this extra redundancy. So the way we did that was computing the normal form. So this essentially just picks a single uh, representation from the equivalence class. And I won't go into today the details of how you do this, but the details are in the paper if you're interested. And Al has a very lovely paper uh, which goes into normal forms much more in depth. So moving on to genetic algorithms, these algorithms are super, super simple to understand because they simply mimic the process of natural selection, and we all know this process very well. You start off with a population of individuals. The individuals for us were bit lists, so this is just a list of zeros and ones. First thing you do is you rank the population based on some fitness function, and of course the fitness function depends on the problem. I'll give you the details of our fitness function in a second. Next thing you do is you read fit pairs of individuals from your population to produce a new generation. And there's many different ways you can do these two things, but essentially you pick fit pairs of individuals from your population based on some fitness function, uh, sorry, some probability distribution, and fit pairs are, sorry, individuals are selected for breeding if they have a high fitness score. And to breed, to do crossover, uh, again, there's many ways you can do this, with bit lists, this is uh, very simple, or there is a very simple way to do this. What we did was just randomly select positions in the bit list with parents and just exchange the work to that point. Final thing to do in the process is do mutation. So for us, that just meant randomly selecting 
position, uh, some bits from the population and flipping them. So a zero becomes a one and a one becomes a zero. And this, uh, of course, maintains variety in the population and stops you just generating an entire population of identical individuals. And then, yeah, now you have a new population. You repeat this process over and over again. And if all goes to plan, then the fitness of your population should increase over time. Okay, that's a very general overview of genetic algorithms. Now I want to talk about the details of our specific algorithm. So for us, the environment of which the genetic algorithm searches is the space of all possible vertex matrices. So say we're working in n dimensions and I set the maximum number of vertices to be n, then this is a space of all n by n matrices in some specified coordinate range. So we want to convert these vertex matrices into bit lists. So the way we do this is, first of all, flatten the matrix column-wise to get a 1D list. Then we subtract a negative number min from every entry. And this just ensures that every entry in the list is positive. The next thing we do is we convert each of the positive integers into a binary number. And finally, prepend all of the binary numbers with some zeros just to ensure that they're all of the same length. And that means that our environment therefore consists of all possible bit lists of a set length. And the length is defined by the dimension times the number of maximum vertices times the binary length. And then because a bit can either be a zero or one, there's two possibilities, the size of the environment is then two to the power of the length of the bit list. So it's easier to see this as an example. So here's a simple 2D polytope and its vertex matrix. Step one, we flatten the matrix column-wise. Step two, we subtract min from every entry, where min is minus three, so add three to every entry to get this new list of positive integers. Then we convert each of these integers into binary, and finally three pence and zeros that we have like three. So this, it looks very unphysical, and it is very, I mean, you see this bit list, you don't automatically think it's a polytope, which is really, Surprising when we see the results that even in this representation, the algorithm does very well. So as I said, for genetic algorithms, the fitness function depends on the problem. So for us, the problem is we wanted to generate reflexive polytopes. So our fitness function gives a score to a polytope based on how close it is to being reflexive. And if you remember, I defined a polytope to be reflexive if it's a lattice polytope satisfying an MPE property, such that its dual is also a last photo of satisfying the IP property. But there is, that, however, an equivalent definition, uh, and this is in terms of the hyperplane representation of polytope. And it says that a polytope is reflexive if and only if it satisfies the IP property, and also if all of its hyperplanes lie at a distance one from the origin. And then it's this definition of uh, reflexivity that we used to define our fitness function. So ignore the last term for now, just considering the first two terms. IP of delta is one if delta satisfies the IP property and zero otherwise. So if delta is reflexive, the first term is going to vanish. And then our second term, we have a sum of all of the distances from the origin of the hyperplanes from one. And again, if delta is reflexive, these AIs are going to be one. So that second term is also going to vanish. So this means the fitness score of a reflexive polytope is zero. And then if Delta isn't reflexive, you get some negative fitness score. And then finally, the third term, we include this when we want to search for that aren't just reflexive, but also have a certain number of points. And as I'll show you in a second, is what we did in certain situations. So this time, NP of delta is the number of points of your polytope, and NP zero is a desired number of points. So maybe I should actually make clear what I mean by points. So this polytope, for example, has five vertices in red, but it also has three interior points and another interior point of the passive layer. So it has five vertices, but nine points. So that's what I mean by points. So yeah, the Ws are, of course, just weights. You can uh, turn the terms off by just setting them equal to zero. So when we don't care about the number of points, we set W3 to zero. And to be honest, we don't really fine tune it much. We just set it to be one if we want it to be on. The final thing I want to say about our genetic algorithm is the method by which we select pairs of individuals for breeding. 
So this is the probability yeah. equation. This is called uh, the roulette wheel selection method. So F bar is the average fitness of your population. F max is the maximum fitness of your population. F x is the fitness of your individual. And then this alpha is just some parameter that determines by how much the fittest individual is likely to be selected. So using this probability distribution, we select uh, half as many um, pairs for breeding, and then each pair will produce two offsprings. So this gives us back a population of the same size. Yeah, question? No. So yeah, you pick parents, breed them, and then the parents go and the children stay. No, we don't. There is actually, it's a good point, there is what we call elitism, something I didn't actually mention in this, but it's, <laughs> yeah, it's the way of life. <laughs> we die and then we, <laughs> people take over. But uh, yeah, elitism is something I didn't mention in my PowerPoint, but is this thing where you keep just the fittest individual and that does remain in the population for us. Well, in general, no, the parents go. So before I show you the results, I want to just explain how we generate a data set with the genetic algorithm. So first of all, we randomly generate a population, a random bit list. Then we evolve the population by going through that loop I showed of ranking, uh, selection, crossover, mutation. We do this several times over. Uh, actually, for all of our experiments, the number of generations we set to be 500. And then we extract all of the polytopes generated during that process that are reflexive, remove all of the sexual equivalence redundancy that I spoke about uh, by computing the normal forms and then deleting the duplicates. And then this process of going to step one, step four is what we call run, run. And then we repeat that process for several runs until we find all reflexive polytopes. So in the lower dimensions where there exists, sorry, question. Yeah. Yeah, so this is the probability distribution, and then we use this probability distribution to select the. No. Yeah, just, yeah. Is that seems to be a point of number of generations where the population just kind of starts evolving in a way? Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting to see actually. It's like you evolve the population, and sometimes you suddenly get a whole population of really fit individuals. And then, because you have mutations, something weird can happen, and suddenly you get like no fit uh, individuals in the population. Yeah, it's yeah, it's like life, I guess. It's uh, natural selection. Um, so yes, step one four is a run. We repeat this run until we generate all the reflexive polytopes. Uh, in the lower dimensions, we know the total number because there's a complete classification. So we just stop the runs when we reach the total number. But in five dimensions, we don't know how many there are. So then in this case, we stop the search once we receive no new reflexive polytopes in a thousand runs. So the total will plateau. So now we're on to the really good bits, the results. So as I said, complete classification in two, three, and four dimensions. It made sense to start in the easiest case and work our way up. So in two dimensions, there are just 16 reflexive polytopes. See them in here. And by setting the vertex coordinate range to be minus three to four and setting the maximum of vertices to be six, we define an environment that captures all of the 16. And this environment contains around 10 to the 11 states. So already in two dimensions, we have a large environment. But amazingly, just after a single run of our genetic algorithm, which takes of the order of less than a minute, we generated all the 16 polytopes. Uh, and in doing so, the genetic algorithm only searched a tiny, tiny fraction of the environment. So already in two dimensions, I think this result is really remarkable, especially as I said earlier, how unphysical this bit, this representation. Yes, question. Do I read it run for fun? Yeah, I mean, you've got everything. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, we keep like the yeah, safe list. No, I mean, we just like, yeah, like I said, we, for the ones where we know the total number, we just stop once we've got all of them. I mean, I'd be very surprised if you ran in and found a new one. I mean, <laughs> no, I mean, how long does it take to come back to? 
Well, so yeah, because you have these systems for the exponential, you know, some of them disappear and you can people work with it. Oh, okay. Yeah, maybe I should be clear about the process. So when, um, so this, so we do this like 500 times and we have this, like then we have 500 populations of like, say the population is 100 today. So we have like this huge uh, amount of individuals and we just select the ones that are reflexive, produce them. And then we have this like separate list that we keep. And then we do it again. So it's not like the reflexive ones are then the parents and they come back. Yeah, we save them. So moving on to three dimensions. Uh, now, of course, we're in a higher dimension, so our environment increases because we have one extra dimension, but also we need to increase our vertex coordinate range to be minus seven to eight, and the maximum of vertices to be 14 in order to capture all of the 4,319. So now we have an environment which is, uh, has 10 to the 51 states. So this is a huge environment, uh, but amazingly, even so, the genetic algorithm managed to find all of the reflexive polytopes, and it did so in around 100,000 runs. Uh, and again, the fraction of states it visited during a search is tiny. So this is also a very remarkable result. Uh, and Tom's not here, but I need to thank him for these plots because I stole all of them from his website. He has a nice diagram and also a full breakdown of every reflexive point in So you should definitely go and play around on his website. Uh, no, uh, that's kind of one of the downsides of genetic algorithms, or at least I think so, is that you don't get like a learned function at the end that you can do some sort of feature extraction and learn something from it. It's just like a tool. It's the whole process is very random. It's not learning a function and perfecting that. So, uh, so I can't say that for certain because we tried some different stuff and we didn't get it working well enough to work. But I think if genetic algorithms work this well, I imagine other algorithms would also work. And that's why I think reinforcement learning would be something to go back and try because then you get a learned policy at the end and then maybe you can learn something from the end. Yeah. But I can't see how you would learn something from genetic algorithms. So do you think this is something specific about the underlying the the Maybe it's a sort of like a uh, way you can construct a reflexive polytope like bit by bit. So it's this like, uh, let's get one of my, that's a good diagram to use. This bit, for example, like this, like base bit, like is like, you know, there's no zero point of the amount of the so that's a good bit. So maybe that would save, it knows that that's like a good part. So when you build a block construction, means it's a meaning which genetic algorithm. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. It's something we also thought as well. Honestly, we were surprised it even worked this well. Uh, yeah, because it seems to us quite a dumb algorithm. Um, but yeah, I mean, it worked. So that is a good thing. So yeah, in four dimensions. Yeah, sorry, question. So, yeah, it's like the output is only one and zero, right? Like, the output of. The output of the. Of, like, so the uh, I don't even like I don't know what your loss function would be here. I don't so like the, the output of that like, the output. The output I mean the output is just the population, input population, you output population, you input population, you output population. And you can extract what you want from the population, but it's not like you get like a value at the end. It's not like some. And that's based on the what you satisfy the uh, Oh, so the fitness function, yeah, yeah. it gives you like a, a zero. It's either one or zero. Just, like... So the fitness function, no, but if you're telling whether uh, there's this like terminality, so if the fitness function, so the fitness score is zero, then it's reflective, it's terminal. So yeah, you can assign it a one if it's not terminal, it's a zero. Is that what you mean? Yes. Yeah. You know, like that's why we have to do like it's a it's not like the thing is it's not like the let's say we want more maximizing the function and then we get closer and closer to the but the theory is like uh seems very discreet. It's very discreet. I think genetic algorithms, yeah, they're not I don't think they're continuous in any sense unless you sort of look at the average fitness of the population. I guess that maybe Yeah, why why be able to 
we are surprised too. Yeah, I, I really can't uh, explain it. Uh, yeah, question? Yeah, it sort of is very different to every normal machine learning algorithm you use where you are learning something. This is just, yeah, you're just randomly like passing things up and sitting them together and taking good ones. Uh, yeah, any other questions? Yeah, Ed? So, uh, well, even though your IP condition is discrete, zero to one, your pipeline condition is. Yeah, so yeah, the fitness isn't discrete. Like you can, uh, where it was. Yeah, this, yeah, of the IP is discrete, but then that's it. The second term is what it gets. Okay, so four dimensions, we have a complete classification, but the total number is half a billion. So we didn't think it was worth our time regenerating this entire data set. Uh, one, it would take a very long time, but also something I should note is that our algorithm works very well at generating the small polytopes uh, for two reasons. So if the small polytopes usually have a small number of vertices, and also uh, the vertices in large polytopes tend to be further away from the origin, which means they have a large vertex coordinate. And that means you have to define a much, much larger environment in order to capture these. So in such a large environment, the number of reflexive polytopes in this environment is very sparse and genetic algorithms don't do well once you reach a certain sparsity level. And so, yeah, we just in four dimensions and then again in five dimensions, just considered generating the smallest possible polytopes. And by small, I mean, it has a small number of points. So that's when we include this third term in the fitness function I showed you. So just considering the five smallest possible numbers of points in four dimensions, the smallest possible is six because we have five vertices and then one from the interior point of the origin. And then we went up to 10. So the first column is the number of points. The second column is the number of reflexive polytopes for that set number of points as taken from Corrigan Schlafer's data. The third column gives the number of runs it took our genetic algorithm to reach all of the reflective polytopes. And then the final column is the fraction of states it visits during the search. So even, amazingly, even in four dimensions, we found all of the reflect, small reflective polytopes. So this, at this point, we were uh, crossing our fingers for five dimensions and our prayers were answered. Even in five dimensions, we found the reflexive polytopes, the small ones at least. So again, we focus on the smallest, five smallest possible points. And you can see the smallest case, which is found to nine of these end points, but up to 11 points, we're finding around 90,000 of these. So as I said at the beginning, there's a partial data set in 5G. So we wanted to compare our polytopes to the ones that already exist and see which ones are, are new. And our big takeaway message from the project is that yes, some of the polytopes that we generated were brand new. So we claim, and well, it's true, we've generated new Fabian fourfolds by generating new uh, five dimensional reflexive polytopes. Now we thought, what can we do with our new data sets? So, one thing we thought about was looking at the topological properties of the Fabians. So, there are certain properties, and Ed spoke about Hodge numbers yesterday, that you can get just from the polytope information. This formula is taken directly from the resolution of paper, uh, just to let you know what the terms are. Delta is the polytope, delta star is the joule, L is the number of points, and then L star is the number of interior points, and then Peter is the face of the polytope, and Peter star is the face of the joule polytope. <laughs> so you can, if you stare at this formula for a bit, you can see if you wanted H11 to be one, this small, uh, a low number of H11, then you're going to need a small dual polytope because this is only one of small numbers. So small polytopes is exactly what we generated. Uh, so we thought, okay, let's compute all of the dual polytopes of the ones we've generated and extract those which give us H11 equal to one. And we found exactly 15 of these. Um, so seven of them came from seven point data sets, and eight of them came from eight point data sets, 
found no such examples in the required data sets. So we're pretty confident that uh, the 15 that we found are all possible 15, but all possible five dimensional effects of body shapes that give us H11 equal to one. Uh, so we put this as a conjecture. Um, and it would be incredible if someone could actually prove this rigorously. We thought about it and had some sort of vague arguments. Uh, but yes, at the moment, we conjecture. So the final thing I want to show you is showcasing how our genetic algorithm can be used for more directed searches. So this, we took an example from the literature, which gave a uh, condition on the Euler number of the clavial in order for us to have unbroken n equals one supersymmetry. And this is that the Euler number must be divisible by 24, by 224, and by 504. So by making a simple amendment to our fitness function, which basically just penalizes for every polytope that doesn't give you that divisibility, um, and running this algorithm just for 10 runs, we managed to generate 21 examples. And just for reference, the paper where we found this condition, they also gave some examples. And the way they did that was they basically just exhaustively searched uh, Scarf and Scholler's list, and they found eight polytopes there. So our genetic algorithm, in a matter of a few minutes, managed to find more examples. So this is an example where actually our genetic algorithm is better in searching the database. Yes, question? Uh, no, this is for compact time and how they are for the yes. minimum symmetric in uh, so for so for for eleven. Oh yeah, sorry, three D. You're asking me questions. I say that you're asking me questions. <laughs> yeah, I can send you the paper afterwards. But yes, I have to admit I don't know the specific details of this. But I do have the reference I can show you. So yeah, to conclude uh, the results, the genetic algorithm successfully generated all sets of objects in two and three dimensions. In four dimensions, it generated all of the small polytopes. And then again, in five dimensions, we generated small effects of polytopes. Uh, comparing these to Scarf and Scholar's database, we found new ones. So we generated new Clavier fourfolds. And we put a conjecture on the number of possible five dimensional effects of polytopes, giving a fourfold of H11 equal to one. And we showcased the capability of our algorithm to do a directed search. And really, I think this last point is the one that's most interesting because it sort of gives this new approach. Because in, in string theory, we're often dealt with having a large number of clavials to deal with. And the usual method is just exhaustively searching these complete databases. But this approach suggests maybe we could specify particular properties of our clavial and give that to the genetic algorithm. And it can just give us some examples to play with. So sort of in that vein, the now the next thing we're looking into is can these genetic algorithms also do triangulations of polytopes? So I said earlier, that in general, a polytope will give you a singular toric variety, and then the clavial have surface inherits these singularities. But taking certain triangulations, which are called fine regular star triangulations of the polytope, you can get a resolution of these singularities. So what do I mean by all these terms? Well, fine just means that every point is included in the triangulation. Uh, regularity is the condition that you can obtain the triangulation, giving a point, uh, sorry, a height to every point in the polytope, raising this polytope up into one higher dimension, computing the convex hull, and then projecting down the lower faces, and that's what gives you this resolution. And finally, star means that every simplex in your triangulation contains the origin as a vertex. So this triangulation is regular by construction. So if we're, we're trying out this now, and if we succeed in also generating triangulations of genetic algorithms, we hope that we could then sort of combine the powers of the two, and then we have an algorithm that gives you the ability to generate more specific caveats. Because Hodge numbers, as I said, you can get just from the polytope, but there's other properties of the clavial that you need the triangulation information for. So, for example, the intersection numbers, uh, something that comes from the triangulation. So, ideally, you'd say, I don't know, I want a clavial fourfold with H11 equal to one. I want 
Oya number six, which I think Ed mentioned yesterday, allows us to have three generations of leptons. And I want it to be K3 electron divided, which is a condition of uh, F theory. And then hopefully the genetic algorithm run gives me some examples I can play around with. And that's it. So yeah, please, if you are interested, check out the paper in the GitHub. And yeah, I'll take any more questions from anyone. <laughs>